Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December Staff Booster Sessions. My name is Daniel Dacombe, and I am your host. I work for the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba in Communications and Projects, and I am pleased to bring these sessions to you today. COVID-19 has challenged health system workers to change how we conduct ourselves in the workplace, in our homes, and in our social connections. These changes can sometimes feel overwhelming. So these staff booster sessions are produced by Shared Health and their Psychological Health and Safety Committee partners and are aimed at providing support to staff in these challenging times. Today, we are joined by Dr. Sarah Yatchison. Dr. Yatchison is a registered psychologist with the Psychological Association of Manitoba. She attained her PhD in School and Applied Psychology from McGill University. Her experience includes providing psychological services to youth and their families in school, hospital, and private practice settings. Dr. Yatchison believes strongly in supporting individuals to recognize their strengths and current efforts while providing practical strategies to manage hardships and improve well being. She presently works for the Manitoba Adolescent Treatment Center as a psychologist. Please note this session is recorded. As such, there is unfortunately no opportunity to take questions at this time. The video of this session, as well as slides and handouts, will be made available at a later date, and you'll receive an email at that time with a link to the recording and handouts. If you experience technical difficulties, please contact your organization's IT support. Please direct all other questions to Daniel Dacom at ddacom at afm.mb.ca. Dr. Yatchison, please take it away. Hi everyone, it's a true honor to be presenting as part of this initiative in support of health system workers uh, across the province. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, to clarify, given the diverse array of caregiving that's taking place during this time, this presentation is geared towards anyone who is personally caring for school-aged children between four and 12 years of age. So I'd like to offer some information, uh, tips for caregiving during the pandemic. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that Manitoba is on the original lands of the Dakota, Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Diné, Inuit, and Métis Nation. We acknowledge that Manitoba Adolescent Treatment Centre is located on Treaty 1 territory. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities in spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. All right, so right now, it goes without saying, but I think it's very worthy to say that it's a very trying time. And what makes this pandemic so stressful? Well, on a very fundamental level, attachment is our greatest need. It is synonymous with survival, not just for humans, but for all mammals. And during hardship and crisis, we have instincts to, uh, to go together, to take care of one another. Attachment is especially vital for children who rely at their age and stage in life on safe, trusted caregivers to protect and provide for them in a big world. They need this to feel safe, to learn, to have fun, and to rest. If attachment is our most preeminent need, then separation is a major threat. And this goes for instances of actual separation as well as anticipated separation. As humans, we can imagine, we can predict, we can contemplate things. And so merely thinking about loss and disconnection can elicit the same sense of threat as actual separation. And so this is very challenging and stressful and it can lead us to feeling fear, sadness, loneliness, and grief. So COVID-19 pushes our faces into separation. Physically, we are not able to gather and be close to one another. Beyond this, it also reminds us of our mortality and other people's mortality. There's also been a loss of our routines, our rituals, traditions, and a sense of familiarity that we had pre-pandemic. And the pandemic has also threatened uh, the, and caused the loss of our plans, our roles, and our goals. So this, at least in part, is why the pandemic has been so stressful. It causes us to face separation. And separation is stressful because togetherness is a primary need that we have. So knowing that this is a time of separation, what can parents do to support their children? Well, one answer is to tap into instincts that, as a caregiver, you have to connect meaningfully with your children. One way is to check in, to connect through conversation. So invite your children to talk, to share how they're feeling and thinking, 
and invite them regularly to do this with you. Make yourself available by letting them know that they can come to you when they want to talk or when they have a question. And this can be really helpful because they may not always want to engage or chat when you offer them to. Prompt discussions by asking them questions that are relative, relevant to at this time during the pandemic. So what have you been hearing lately? Anything that you're wondering? What worries do you have? How are you doing with all these changes? Are there any changes that have been the hardest for you? Are there any that you like? I've heard this too from children. There are still some things that have been altered in their environment that they actually appreciate right now. And lastly, what do you miss? So the latter questions get them to really reflect, to look inwards and express and receive comfort about the separation and the loss that they've experienced during this pandemic. And so there are also several important points that I'd like to emphasize to parents as they check in. First of all, stay focused and listen. With so much else going on, it can be really easy for our minds to drift off and think about something else, for instance, supper, how work is gonna to go tomorrow, and try to set that stuff aside and devote your attention to what your children, what your children are saying during these check-ins. Try to set, um, so, sorry, try to get them cues such as eye contact and nodding to let them know that you are understanding and taking in what they are saying. Next, understand and name their emotions. So this is so key. Parents can do this by looking out for feeling words such as sad, mad, frustrated, missing and worried. And repeat them back to your child and let them know that you get it. So a parent might say, you said you were feeling sad because you haven't been able to play tag at recess and you really loved playing tag. This must be so hard. So you can share your understanding of the emotion, even if you have a different point of view or perspective. It's really about um, not countering or challenging them in that moment with coming up with a fix or a way of making it better, but rather saying that you're hearing what they're saying and that you can understand and just sort of letting them sit with that feeling. This goes a long way for calming them down when they are upset. Children may also need some support in naming their feelings. For instance, a parent might say, so you told me you weren't able to play your favorite game at recess, which you love to play. I'm guessing that that might have made you feel sad or frustrated, is that right? So there is a, a notion in the psychology world, or a saying, I should say, that says you gotta name it to tame it. So try to seek some words to describe the feelings that they may be having in situations. Next, give some physical comfort, offer that to your children. Hugs promote the release of feel good and bonding hormones. Touch is a powerful calming, uh, has a powerful calming effect on our physiological systems. And research suggests that after 20 seconds, it can reduce our heart rate and our blood pressure. So it's such an important thing for family members to give each other at this time, especially as you're sharing a household together and can make that contact with each other. Encourage questions and be honest when you don't know the answer. So give them enough information to answer the questions that they have, not going too far off into other aspects um, that they may not be interested or, or curious about. And find credible and kid-friendly sources to obtain information. Avoid exposing them to the news or too much news as it may not be appropriate developmentally for them. And it can be quite alarming at times for children to see. Reassure them of the ways that adults are keeping them safe and what they are doing to reduce their risk. Focus on what they can control, as this graphic states, as this will empower them to know that they're doing their best at this time. So frequent hand washing, wearing a mask, social distancing are all things that they can maintain to do their part. And show helpful ways of handling feelings. Parents are certainly not immune to feeling loss, sadness, anger, stress. You can show and name these feelings in front of your children when they arise, as well as offer ways in which you're, do, you're, you're managing those feelings and you're taking care of yourself. It is important to let children know as well that it is not, not their job to take care of their parents and make them feel better. It's really reassuring them that you have, you've got that when you're, when you're feeling upset and, and worried. 
Given the separation of normalcy in our daily schedules due to COVID-19, parents can also support their children and the sense of real pervasive separation by setting some routines that are realistic at this time. So this might be clarifying and solidifying certain activities that are part of a bedtime or a morning routine or an after school routine. Specify what these activities are and this can actually promote a sense of independence and predictability as well as a sense of security when they're communicated to the child to your child one can use a visual schedule such as the one on the slide here and post it in a relevant space in the house to remind children what they need to do and promote that they do this more on their own you might also consider planning a fun weekly activity this could include baking, cooking, outdoor play, crafting, movie nights, maybe a family awards night where you make up certain titles for family members and what they did well over the week. Um, I've also had families who've conveyed um, having open world gaming challenging nights. So they will play a video game together where they're on a deserted island trying to survive um, as a way of bonding together. So you can mark these on a calendar and help children to foresee them, to get excited, as well as to battle some boredom that can take place right now with less uh, activities available to us. And really importantly is to grieve the loss of rituals this year and find alternatives. So really reflecting on the meaning of traditions that we have had in our lives, as well as family gatherings with loved ones and feel that loss and that longing to do those activities right now that we can't do. Consider virtual meetings, sending letters to loved ones and other activities within the household that could become temporary or even maybe long-standing traditions after this year. Something so vital, and it can also be very tough to do, is parental self-care. Taking care of oneself is not selfish or self-indulgent. In fact, being considerate to oneself enables us to be more caring to others. So create, intentionally create space to recharge for yourself. Family members do not necessarily have the time alone that they used to because our days are spent at home more with each other. So gone are the potentially are the commutes back and forth from work or the extracurricular activities for kids. So it's very acceptable to take some time alone if possible. Make healthy choices. So eating as well as you can, sleeping, exercising, getting outdoors. A new activity that we really enjoy doing in our household is visiting the river walk to see the wildlife. It's actually very restorative. You can also connect with ad other adults. So calling up a friend, relatives, coworkers, and talk about how you're doing, maybe not just as a parent, but also as an individual. And setting up realistic expectations. So maybe you, can, you can't institute a consistent daily routine. Um, right now, it might be feasible to really narrow in on a consistent uh, bedtime activity for your child. Now is not the time to really demand perfection. In fact, studies suggest that parents only need to get it right 30% of the time to have well-adjusted children who grow up to be um, productive adults in society. So as the baseline is 30% that we aim for, right now during a pandemic, you have a lot of leniency to figure things out and do your best. Having self-compassion for yourself is very, very important. Practicing that on a daily basis, if you can. Acknowledging the suffering and the struggle that can happen, that you're not alone in feeling this way. And also being conveying some patience and some kindness towards yourself. Um, I've recently heard that providing a lot of empathy and care to others without a lot of compassion to oneself can elicit feelings of burnout. So it's really important to share some of that um, some of that care and consideration to yourself as an adult and a, and a parent. And then seek an activity that you enjoy. It might be puzzling with some music on, which is a favorite of mine. Could be building a model car, watching TV or reading a book. If you, if you can't get alone time, then consider doing something with your family that you really enjoy. So in short, listen to your instincts as a caregiver to connect with your children during this time of immense separation and also take moments to take care of yourself too.
So thank you for joining me today and for your and also for your efforts every day. Take care, everyone.